So today we're going to continue our survey of theoretical approaches to understand the fraction and quantum Hall effect. We discussed in earlier videos uh, the, the approach of trial wave functions. We discussed briefly numerical techniques. We talked about wire constructions. And today we are going to talk about flux attachment. So let's start. Our starting point is the Hamiltonian of electrons in a magnetic field with a kinetic term, with a Coulomb interaction term. We neglect this order because uh, life is complicated enough without it. And we'd like, in principle, we'd like to solve Schrodinger's equation. Now, not only that we'd like to solve the equation and get the solution, but it has to be an electronic solution, meaning it has to satisfy fermionic uh, uh, statistics and get the minus sign when we interchange the position of two electrons. Now, we can look at this, uh, you know, from one angle. We can look at it from the other angle. It's not going to help. We don't know how to exactly solve it. So we need to um, find an approximation scheme. And our approximation scheme starts from a transformation, from a definition of a new wave function, chi, which is related, which is a function of the same electronic coordinates, and is related uh, to the um, Psi wave function, the one we talked about in the earlier slide, by a phase factor, which I can write as e to the minus i lambda. Now, this is basically a gauge transformation. Uh, this, this phase factor, it's e to the minus alpha. Alpha is a, a number, uh, and we'll talk about this number uh, in a minute. And then a sum of all pairs of uh, electron coordinates. And uh, for each pair, we get the argument of the vector that connects uh, the two electrons in the pair. The argument of a vector, mind you, is the angle it uh, um, forms with, the with some arbitrary x-axis. Now, um, this is our new wave function, and we'd like to uh, have a, an equation for this wave function. Now, you know, the multiplying a, a, a function by a phase factor is a gauge transformation. So a gauge transformation, what it does, it introduces a vector potential. So our, the uh, uh, equation that chi satisfy, satisfies would be a Schrodinger equation. Chi satisfies a, a Schrodinger equation, but with a different Hamiltonian. Now, the difference between the Hamiltonian age and the Hamiltonian uh, that chi uh, satisfies would be only in the introduction of a new vector potential because it's a gauge transformation. It's a unique gauge transformation. Uh, and we'll talk about it. But, but it's a gauge transformation. So we have a new uh, vector potential. Now, a gauge transformation usually introduces a, a, a vector potential whose curl is 0, because it doesn't introduce new magnetic fields. But this is a special gauge transformation in the sense that it is singular. So let's see that. So, so the vector potential A at the point R, or I, would, would uh, be the gradient of this uh, uh, lambda with respect to our I. So it would be the gradient with respect to our I of the, uh, of the sum of the arguments. And I won't uh, write all the details. Uh, what is important is that the, this, this uh, function, the argument, has a singularity as, the, as two electrons get close to one another, as Ri and Rj get close to one another. And that singularity manifests itself when we take the curl of A. The curl of A is the curl of a gradient of this, of, of, of the argument, basically. It involves uh, uh, the curl of the gradient of the argument. Now, because of the singularity of the argument at the point uh, 0, the curl of the gradient of the argument is a delta function. And the curl of A is, is a, a alpha, the, this alpha from the phase factor, multiplied by the flux quantum. That comes out of uh, fixing units and so on. And then a set of delta functions, uh, or sum of a delta functions, uh, and the delta functions of the coordinate at which we look uh, for A uh, minus the coordinate of the electrons. Basically, what this tells us, this 
it's just the electronic density at the point R, right? So what this tells us is that this procedure introduces a vector potential whose curl is alpha times a, a phi naught times the density, which is another way of saying with this transformation, we attach alpha flux quanta to each electron. Each electron now carries on its back alpha flux quanta. Now, what's the value of alpha? Well, let's look at this factor. When we interchange the, coordinate of, or the coordinates of two electrons, uh, the vector that connects them gets a minus sign. So the argument gets an extra uh, uh, shift of pi. So, so this uh, factor gets a pi when we interchange two co the coordinates of two electrons, which means the, the, uh, uh, this entire thing gets an e to the i alpha pi, or e to the minus i alpha pi, which means if alpha is not an integer, this function chi is not single valued. And that's not something we'd like to do today. Moreover, if alpha is an even integer, then this factor e to the minus i alpha pi is just one. For example, if alpha is two, then this phase factor is, is just one, which means the statistics of this and of this is the same, which means this one, this chi, will uh, uh, describe to us fermions. And in fact, we're going to uh, take, make that choice of alpha being integer. So we'll take alpha to be an integer, an even integer, and then when alpha is even, we will have a wave function that describes fermions, and since they are composed of uh, uh, the, the, the uh, electron charge and the alpha flux quanta, they are commonly called composite fermions. The transformation is uh, called flux attachment for obvious reasons. We attached flux quanta to the electrons, and it's also called chern simons transformation. It was introduced uh, 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 by, by Chern and Simons uh, 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 in a different context. Now, um, we can look, look at it pictorially in the following way. We started from a system that had electrons in it that were subjected to a magnetic field. The magnetic field was, uh, you know, created externally. It's a C number. It's not a quantum operator. Now we have, uh, by, by this transformation, we map the problem onto composite fermions that are subjected to a magnet, the external magnetic field B, but also to the two flux, or the alpha flux quanta. Uh, here in the picture, uh, we, we took alpha equals two, uh, and, and that's actually the, the, the value we will use mostly, uh, but an even number of flux quanta on each electron. So now the magnetic field the, these electrons, or these uh, composite fermions are seeing is the external one minus alpha times phi naught times n. But n is a quantum operator, which means we made the problem, in fact, harder. We started from a problem in which the, the magnetic field was a C number. Now it, the magnetic field became a quantum operator. So the, the problem at, that, at this stage got harder than it was. But the hope is that we will be able to make a, an approximation that will take us, that looked less natural in the original formulation. And indeed, that's what happens. What we will do, we will uh, uh, carry out a mean field approximation or a Hartree approximation in which we will replace this quantum operator by its expectation value. So in mean field theory, we will take the, we will spread basically the, the magnetic field attached to the electrons uniformly over, over the entire sample, and uh, we will uh, uh, transform this to, from being an operator to being a, a, a C number. So now we have, we map the problem onto, uh, uh, from, from the original magnetic field to a different magnetic field delta B that is, uh, that is a C number, but is a different magnetic field. Now, you may wonder, if we attach two flux quanta to each electron, why do the other electrons care? Because uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the other electrons are never at the same point because of Fermi statistics. So, so, so why do they care about a, a, an integer number of flux quanta that are carried on the backs of, uh, of, of other electrons? And you see that within this approximation, they do care. 
because what we what we do is we spread those uh, flux quanta now uniformly over the entire sample. We'll see what this approximation gives us and uh, what are its uh, points of strength, what are its points of weakness, and how do we try to fix those points of weakness. That will take us uh, uh, the rest of this video and the next one. Uh, so first, within this approximation, and now let's, let's focus on alpha equals 2 for the rest of, uh, of, of this video. Uh, so, so, or for most of it. Uh, so we started from a, an electronic problem in which the density was n and the magnetic field was b. And we transformed it to a problem of composite fermions with the same density and a different magnetic field delta b. Now you know the combination of n and b, of, of density and magnetic field, this is what determines the filling factor. In fact, n times phi naught over b is the filling factor. Now here we have, uh, you see, we, we, it's more natural to us to, to look at uh, 1 over the filling factor. Let's just divide uh, uh, both sides by phi naught times n. So divide by phi naught times n. And what we get here, we get uh, delta b over phi naught times n is just 1 over the filling factor that the composite fermions experience. Uh, 1 over nu is uh, b over phi naught n is 1 over the filling factor that the electrons experience. And we are left with these two here, uh, or with this alpha, uh, uh, when we divide by phi naught times n. So this transformation tells us that the electrons at least within mean field approximation. The electrons live under one filling factor. The composite fermions live under a different filling factor. Let's see how this, you know, how they map to one another. Let's start with the uh, value of one third for the electrons. Substitute it here. One, one third, one over one third is three. Minus two is one. And the composite fermion filling factor is one. We could also do 2 over 5. That's as much as I rehearsed at home. Uh, then uh, uh, this will be 5 over 2 minus 2. Uh, we, we are left with 1 half. We invert, and we get new composite fermion equals 2. So look what happens. We map the uh, fractional values of the filling factor of the electron to integer values of the filling factors of the composite fermions. And in fact, the entire series of p over 2p plus 1 maps onto, an, uh, uh, which, is, which is the series that you mostly see in, in experiments, it maps onto p, onto integer quantum Hall effect for, fermi for composite fermions. So this is the big thing about this mapping. We map the fractional quantum Hall effect of the uh, electrons onto integer quantum Hall effect of the composite fermions. And basically, all filling factors with an odd denominator are, 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 are good clients for this kind of transformations. Uh, now, why is this a good transformation? Because when we have an integer quantum Hall of, uh, effect of anything, composite fermions in this case, it's natural to understand why we would have an energy gap and why we would have a quantization of the uh, whole resistivity and a vanishing of the longitudinal resistivity because we have an integer number of Landau levels which we fill, we fill P uh, Landau levels and then the next Landau level is empty and there's an energy gap. That's the good news. There's also bad news. And the bad news is look at the value of the energy gap. Look at it here. It's, 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 it's a kinetic uh, energy scale. It's a cycloton energy scale. While we expect the energy gap for the fraction quantum Hall effect to come out of electron-electron interaction. So we get the wrong energy scale for the energy gap. We understand why there is an energy gap, but we get the wrong energy scale. Not only that, look, within mean field approximation, it's a healthy approximation. The, the, the interaction makes no difference. Suddenly, it seems from this approximation as if the fraction quantum Hall effect is all analyzed by this uh, uh, by this uh, Chan Simons transformation is all analyzed at the level of the kinetic term without worrying about uh, the interaction term. We'll have to deal with this uh, uh, at some point, but at the moment we are just going to go with it. Uh, and by, by saying we are going to go with it, what I mean is this. 
We're going to start with the filling factor one third, in which the magnetic field delta B is strong enough for the composite fermion to uh, form a, 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 a fractional quantum, for, for the composite fermions to form an integer quantum wall state, which means for the electrons to form the celebrated one third. Uh, state and then we're going to look also at uh, 2 over 5 and so on. So we're going to start by looking at a large delta P, delta B, at which uh, uh, the composite fermions form Landau levels and fill them one by one. And then we'll take the, the, uh, this delta B to be smaller and smaller until, it's, uh, 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 until uh, you, know, you remember delta B is B minus 2 flux quanta times the density which means delta B equals zero for nu equals one half. So we are going to explore this uh, regime from one third to one half, uh, reducing the value of delta B uh, as we go along. And we start from, from this, from, from, from the large delta B. Uh, now, uh, what can we do? What, what does this... Uh, uh, scheme uh, uh, allow us to do um, when we study fractional quantum whole states of this type. Well, we know, for one thing, I'm going to, to describe two things. Uh, the first one is we know that a fractional quantum whole state must involve a fractionally charged quasi-particle. For one third, in fact, we, we saw that the charge would be one third. How does this come about? I mean, these composite fermions carry an electron charge and two, two flux quanta. How do we see a fractional charge coming in? Well, let's put in a, fraction, a, a composite fermion into uh, the system. Let's say we have, again, uh, some P Landau levels which are filled. Uh, uh, and now we are going to bring a new composite fermion and uh, uh, populate one more state in the, uh, uh, in the next Landau level, the one that I, the p plus one lambda level of the composite fermions that is a, at the moment empty. Uh, how do you put in a composite fermion? You put its charge and you put its flux quanta. When you put the charge, you add the charge e to the system. When you put the flux quanta, we saw what happens uh, 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 when we talked about fractional charge before. When you add the flux quanta, just the, think about the flu two flux quanta as turn, being turned on adiabatically. When you turn them on adiabatically, they create an azimuthal electric field. When they create an azimuthal electric, electric field, an azimuthal electric field, they create a radial current. And, uh, uh, and they deplete the charge at the point where you put the, uh, uh, the composite fermion. So, so we need to account also for that charge that goes away. So we added an electron charge at the first step, and then we have the uh, charge that's being pushed out. Now, what's the value of that, char of that charge? It's two flux quanta, the amount of flux we turn on, multiplied by sigma xy of the system. And sigma xy is p over 2p plus 1. So you, you just do these arithmetics, and you find that the charge is e over 2p plus 1, which means for nu equals 1 third, the charge, commonly uh, written as E star, is one third. But for a, a two over five, it's one over five, right? Because E over two P plus one is one over five, P equals two. For three over seven, is, uh, the, the charge is one over seven. And I guess you got the idea. The, uh, it's always one over the, the denominator 1 over 2p plus 1, uh, independent of what is the numerator of the filling factor. Um, so this is the third thing that this uh, 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 composite fermion al analysis allowed us to uh, look at. Now, uh, there's another thing with that which I'd like to uh, describe to you, and this is uh, how composite fermion theory uh, allow, allows us to uh, calculate excitation modes of the system. But in order to see that, we need first of all to understand uh, the difference between the response of composite fermions and the response of electrons. You know, in the lab, we know how to measure electronic resistivity, conductivity. We know how to measure electronic conductivity and resistivity at finite frequency, at finite wave vector. In fact, we're going to talk about this in, in two minutes. Uh, 
but, but everything we measure is the electronic response. We don't measure a response of composite fermions because they are, in some sense, mathematical creatures that we uh, constructed. So we need to understand the relation between, for example, the resistivity of the electrons and the resistivity of the composite fermions. And the uh, uh, most striking uh, way to understand the, the, uh, that they are not the same is to think about nu equals one half. As we said, at nu equals one half, delta b equals zero. Equals zero. So when you put electrons at a half field Landau level, nu equals one half, let's say you put uh, some five Tesla uh, magnetic field to do that, the electrons have a Hall effect. They are subjected to a, um, to a strong magnetic field. They feel the Lorentz force. They have a Hall effect. The composite fermions, on the other hand, don't uh, feel any magnetic field, delta b equals zero. So they don't have a Hall effect. So in order to get from the response of the uh, composite fermions to the observable response of the electrons, we need to fix for that. And the way to fix for it is to add this matrix uh, that's purely whole, and that's the whole resistivity uh, of the nu equals one half state, which, which you can see is coming from the, from the motion of the flux tubes. Right, a composite fermion uh, carries not just the charge, but also two flux tubes. When they move, they create an electric field perpendicular to their motion. And the electric field is just the, the two flux tubes, uh, uh, and in the right units, it becomes 2h over e squared. So it's this electric field that, they, uh, 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 that uh, uh, separates between the composite fermions and the electrons. So, so, so now, if we want to calculate uh, any quantity that is easier to be cal calculated uh, uh, for composite fermions, we calculate, then we substitute in this formula, and then we get uh, 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 the electronic resistivity uh, out of it. In particular, if we think about uh, a clean system and ask ourselves about excitation modes uh, as a function of wave vector and frequency, this is how we uh, frequently analyze uh, electronic systems. So we, we'd like to apply a perturbation, or, or we'd like to look at the uh, wave vector Q and frequency omega and ask wh what are the, uh, what's the dispersion of omega versus Q at which the system has excitations. This is how we look at plasmon. This is how we look at uh, uh, various types of excitations. Uh, so, so we need to calculate this using this formula. Now, for, for fractional quantum Hall states, the composite fermions have integer quantum Hall effect. Integer quantum Hall effect is a, is a phenomenon whose excitations are, are, are easier to calculate than fractional uh, quantum Hall states. And therefore, we'll calculate the response functions for, uh, for, for uh, uh, composite fermions at an integer quantum Hall state and use this formula to uh, get the, the response or, or uh, to, to get uh, the Q and omega at which the determinant of the resistivity, electronic resistivity matrix is zero. These are the values at which current can flow without an electric field. W uh, and and, that, and, and that, that's an example for calculations for nu equals one third and nu equals uh, 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 three over seven uh, uh, um, for, for, for uh, omega and Q. Uh, what are the values at which you, you get uh, excitations. Now, uh, these were two examples for situations at which uh, a composite fermion theory within the mean field approximation allows us to uh, calculate quantities uh, of fractional quantum whole states. In fact, I should say the, the plots I, I, I showed you uh, go beyond mean field approximation and introduce phenomenologically certain uh, uh, modifications to, to, um, to mean field approximation. I will not get into these details. Rather, what I'd like to ask is what happens as we go in our feeling factors or in our delta B to lower delta B or to feeling factors that are closer to, uh, to one half, where we don't, where the, the delta B is not strong enough for the um, composite fermions to form Landau levels and, uh, and show quantum hole uh, physics. Uh, so what happened then? Well, let's first ask what, what uh, happens for electrons 
when they are subjected to a magnetic field that's not strong enough to form uh, the, the integer quantum Hall effect. Uh, so so here, here are electrons at weak magnetic fields. And you see what happens. The resistivity, this is the longitudinal resistivity as a function of magnetic field. The resistivity starts pretty much as constant and then starts oscillating. It starts oscillating and you see those oscillations get bigger and bigger and uh, until at some point they, they become so wild that the minimum value is zero. The resistivity cannot go lower than zero. Uh, and, and then when, when it hits zero, then, then we see quantization of the whole resistivity and we basically arrive to the uh, quantum Hall regime. But before that, we have these oscillations. Now these oscillations, Shubnikov, the Hass oscillation or quantum oscillations, they come out of the fact that if you look at the function of energy at the density of states, for, for uh, magnetic fields at which you see these oscillations, you don't yet see fully formed Landau levels, but you see oscillations uh, which are at the moment uh, 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 too weak to uh, uh, lead to uh, full quantization, to vanishing of OXX and full quantization of uh, OXY. But they do lead to, to these oscillations. You know, more precisely, as we saw before, the issue of localization comes in, uh, and, and these are the range of magnetic fields at which the uh, localization length is too large for you to observe it in an experiment. In any case, that's what electrons do at the weak magnetic field. It's a quant quant those are quantum mechanical oscillations. The density of states shows precursors of Landau levels, uh, but, but they are not quantum hole. Uh, so do composite fermions show the same thing? You see it here, they do. We start, if you look here, you see that uh, 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 this is close to nu equals one half. You see that the resistivity starts as being more or less uh, a uniform and then starts oscillating. You see it starts oscillating uh, and oscillations get bigger and bigger and bigger. And when they get big enough, you start seeing quantum hole physics. You start seeing vanishing of OXX and quantization of OXY. And in fact, it happens not just at, a, at a, a one half, but also at one quarter. And you can see this is the same plot as, as you see up here, uh, simply shifted. Uh, the, the, the blue plot is, is uh, shifted relative to that plot in such a way that one half is put just below one quarter. And you see it's basically the same thing. The resistivity starts as a constant, and as you move away from one half, or move away from one quarter, you, you see uh, oscillations developing until the uh, uh, quantum Hall effect uh, uh, is fully formed. So composite fermions are uh, capable of uh, giving us an explanation of the existence of fractional quantum Hall states by this mapping of the fractional to the integer quantum Hall effect. They are also able to explain these oscillations that you see here or here, uh, which are not uh, fully formed quantum Hall states, but uh, we can uh, see them as Shubnikov, the Hass oscillations of composite fermions. Uh, what happens if delta B gets even weaker? Uh, so, so, you know, what happens to electrons if you put them in a, in a magnetic field that's so weak? that quantum mechanics doesn't uh, change the density of states at all. But just you think about the, the, your electrons classically. What do electrons do in a, in a weak magnetic field? They carry a uh, cyclotron motion, right? And there's a, a, a length scale associated with that cyclotron motion, which is the cyclotron radius, which is, as we know, the momentum multiplied by the speed of light divided by the charge and the magnetic field. And the momentum for, for uh, uh, you know, electronic systems uh, is always the Fermi momentum. That brings up the question, are we going to see something at the length scale of RC star, the composite fermion uh, cyclotron radius, which, which would be, just by analogy, PF times C over E times delta B. So now we want to see a new length scale. Now, if, this, if we see this, 
then this is, this is a quite a, an exciting development because that tells us that this mean field approximation, this questionable mean field approximation of composite fermion theory is capable of predicting a new length scale. Usually, you know, length scales, energy scales, they come out by just giving a look at the Hamiltonian. Uh, and indeed, that's the case for, for the cyclotron radius. Uh, but, but, but this length scale, the cyclotron radius of composite fermions, is not something you just look by dimensional analysis of the Hamiltonian. So if, if, it is, if indeed uh, we can see such a scale, it tells us that composite fermions exist not only at the quantum hole side, but also semi-classically, that the theory tells us something also very far away from the quantum hole uh, regime. Now, how are we going to measure things on, on some finite uh, uh, length scale? Uh, the way to do that, we, need, we basically need to uh, look at the response as a function of Q, of wave vectors, right? And uh, uh, we can do that by uh, uh, patterning a set of gates on our sample uh, with a well-defined uh, distance between the gates. Or alternatively, another way uh, 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 that uh, allows us to do something like that is to uh, irradiate our sample, our electronic system, with uh, surface acoustic waves. Those acoustic waves basically create a potential uh, that has the wave vector of the wave and the frequency of the wave. And being acoustic, uh, the motion uh, is, is pretty slow. And uh, uh, we can think about it as a, a, a potential that has a, uh, that has a well-defined length scale de uh, determined by the wave vector of the, of the uh, acoustic wave. Uh, now, uh, we can measure the response to that acoustic wave by measuring uh, uh, changes of the velocity of uh, propagation, of the sound velocity, or by measuring the uh, absorption of the uh, sound by the electrons. Uh, here what you see is the change of the velocity, and you see it as a function of delta b. And a, clearly you see a feature uh, appearing at some finite delta b. And when you uh, analyze what's the, this delta b and its relation to the uh, um, q, to the uh, wave vector of the acoustic wave, you find that the relation identifies to you uh, the, the cyclotron uh, uh, radius of the composite fermions exactly at the point where you expected it. So indeed, this length scale has a meaning even for delta b's which are so small that uh, y y you don't see any uh, fraction quantum hole effect whatsoever. So this tells us that the cyclotron radius is a measurable quantity, the cyclotron radius of the composite fermions is a measurable quantity even when, when uh, you don't see the composite fermions uh, showing any quantum hole behavior. But now let's look at this uh, uh, cyclotron radius. We have it here. It's the speed of light times the uh, Fermi momentum divided by E delta B. In fact, we can write it equally well as the speed of light times the Fermi momentum divided by the original magnetic field B multiplied by E star, where E star, you remember, is just E over 2P plus 1. So the fractional charge, which we understood as coming as, as a as originating from uh, the formation of this uh, incompressible, uh, glorious fractional quantum wall state, this fractional charge, in fact, has a meaning, it seems, even in, 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 in uh, feeling factor regimes where you don't see fractional quantum wall effect at all. And, and you see that the, the system, at least if you probe the right quantity, looks as if you, it has fractional charges of the fraction quantum wall effect values, but away from the fraction quantum wall effect regime, uh, living in the original magnetic field B. This brings up the natural question of what happens when delta B equals zero. What physics will the new equals one half uh, show us? That's a very important question, but it deserves a different video, and we will discuss it 
in the next video.